Hello everyone. In the previous video lecture, we saw the theory of guna vis a vis bhoja. We have seen that in bhoja's theoretical corpus, the number of gunas have increased from 10 to 24. Bhoja also follows the general pattern of shabda gunas and artha gunas. A new category of guna that we find in bhoja is the guna called Vaisheshika Guna. As we have seen, Vaisheshika Gunas are in fact doshas, but these doshas can sometimes turn out to be gunas in the representation of certain characters. In this class, we are going to see the theory of guna conceptualized by three literary theoreticians, namely Vishveshara, the author of Agni Purana, and Vidyanatha. First, let us see how Vishveshara conceptualizes the idea of Guna. We see the exposition of Vishveshara's idea of Guna in his famous Chamatkara Chandrika. Before we discuss Vishveshara's theory of Guna, let us briefly talk about Vishveshara. Vishveshara was a poet in the court of Singapore Bhala, the author of famous Rasarna Vasudhagara. Vishweshwara closely follows Bhoja in his conception of gunas, except for a few minor deviations. While Bhoja mentions 24 gunas, Vishweshwara accepts only 23. He omits Bhoja's praudi. Vishweshwara removes praudi from the section of gunas and keeps it in the category of alankara. In Vishweshwara, the guna which Bhoja calls Saushabdhya is renamed Shabda Samskara. Similarly, Bhoja Samiti is renamed Samitatva. It is also important to note that, unlike Bhoja, Vishweshwara does not divide gunas into Shabda Gunas and Artha Gunas. He calls all the gunas collectively Kavya Gunas. Now, let us turn our attention to Agni Purana. In the first week, we have formed an overview of Agni Purana and we know that it is of unknown authorship. The author of Agni Purana also subscribes to the view of Vamana that a linguistic composition becomes a kavya when it is embellished by guna. The author of Agni Purana notes, poetry even though embellished does not produce pleasure if it is devoid of gunas. A necklace would only be burdensome to women if their bodies are not beautiful. Akni Purana also rejects the conventional notion that gunas are not mere absence of defects. In other words, gunas cannot be attained just by keeping certain doshas at bay. They are qualities with some positive characteristics. The observation of the Akni Purana Kara is worth quoting in this context. The author says, it cannot be said that excellence would only be the absence of a defect. Excellences such as Shlesha or coalescence and the defects such as Gudartha or obscurity of sense and the like have been distinguished from one another. The author of Akni Purana classifies the gunas first under two heads, namely Samanya gunas and Vaisheshika gunas. The Samanya is further classified into three categories, viz. Shabda guna, Artha guna and Upaya guna. As we all know, the Shabda gunas are poetic merits of sound. The Artha gunas are poetic merits related to sense and finally, Upaya gunas are gunas related to both Shabda and sense. The Shabda gunas or the poetic merits of the sound mentioned by the author of Akni Purana are seven in number. These include Shlesha, Lalitya, Gambhirya, Saukumaryata, Audarya, Ojas and Satyeva Yaugigi. Let us take a look at them in detail. The first guna that we are going to see is Shlesha. According to Akni Purana, Shlesha is a quality 
that arises out of the particular arrangement of words which produces a coalescence or cohesiveness in the structure. To quote Akni Purana, that is said to be Shlesha or the coalescence in which there is a closely coalesced arrangement of words. It is not clear what the author means by the guna Lalitya. In the guna called Lalitya, the author of Akni Purana says, the letters are already combined in the words by grammatical conventions and there is hardly any necessity of further euphonic combinations. The next guna is Gampiriya. The Gampiriya is the quality of containing all concepts of Dhvani. Akni Purana defines Gampiriya as follows. The wise name it as depth or Gampiriya which is a composition chiseled by special characteristics and which contains elevated words. The next Shabda Guna that we are going to see is Sukumarata. Sukumarata consists in words composed mostly of syllables that are not harsh. Audarya is the quality that arises out of clearness of expressions. Ojas is the abundance of compounds. Akni Purana's definition of Ojas is very interesting. It says, Ojas is the life of prose etc. From the highest being to a clump of grass, mandliness come by Ojas alone. The last guna, that is the seventh guna uh, that Akni Purana mentions is uh, Satyeva Yaugigi. It is not clear what the author means by this particular guna. Now, let us take a look at the Artha Gunas. The Artha Gunas are also six in number. The Artha Gunas mentioned by the author include Mathurya, Samvidhana, Komalata, Udarata, Praudi and Samyayikata. Let us see all these six Gunas in detail. The first one we are going to see is Mathurya. Mathurya is the maintaining of tranquil tolerance and calmness of appearance under the influence of emotions like anger and malice. Akni Purana defines Mathurya in the following words. The gravity of appearance even in anger and deep state of composure is Mathurya. It should be noted that in this particular context the word Mathurya is used in the sense of tranquility not in the sense of sweetness. Maybe it could be argued that here the word Mathurya is used to refer to the sweetness that arise out of this tranquility of emotions. The next Artha Guna is Samvidhana. What is Samvidhana? Samvidhana represents the quality that arises out of Gunas finding their proper place. Kamalatva is the quality resulting from the special arrangement of words which is devoid of harshness and inelegance. Akni Purana defines Kamalatva as follows. An arrangement of words free from rigidity that results from setting aside the laxity of structure. The quality called Udarata is the ability of a word to make its meaning comprehensible to the readers even at a superficial attempt. Praudhi is the mature logical reasoning that helps the com completion of the subject of discourse. According to Akni Purana, that is declared Praudhi in which there are mature reasonings impregnated with logical reasonings bringing about accomplishment of what is intended. We are not sure what the author of Akni Purana means by the guna Samya Ikata. According to Rakhavan, the guna called Samya Ekata may mean the suggestion by the poet of an etymology. We have seen the first two categories under Samanya Guna, namely Shabda Guna and Artha Guna. Now, the last category under Samanya Guna, it is none other than Upaya Guna. What is an Upaya Guna? According to Akni Purana, that which embellishes both word and sense 
is known by the name Upayaguna. Upayagunas are also classified into six subcategories, namely Prasada, Saupagya, Yatha Samkhya, Prashastya, Paga, and Raga. Let's see these gunas one by one. The first guna that we are going to see is Prasada. Prasada consists of the use of words of which the meanings are too well known. According to Agni Purana, Prasada is glorified as consisting of words possessing very well known sense. The next guna is Saupagya. What is Saupagya? Saupagya is very much related to Dandin's idea of Udharata. So, Saupagya is the expression of some high merit. According to Akni Purana, that which, when expressed, suggests some eminent attribute is declared by the wise as saupagya or loveliness. The next Upayaguna that Akni Purana talks about is Yatha Samkhya. Yatha Samkhya implies the subsequent mention of things in the order of things previously mentioned. The next poetic merit is Prashastya. Prashastya is praiseworthiness. It is the description of even a terrible object by means of a word that is not terrible or objectionable. This poetic merit is very much similar to Vamana's Arthaguna Saukumarya, where inauspicious words like Murdaha etc. are avoided by the use of more agreeable expressions like Yashaha Shesha etc. This also corresponds to the Arthaguna Saushabdata of Bhoja. The next poetic merit is Paka. Paka is the maturity which implies the highest stage of perfection of a poetic composition. There are four kinds of Pakas, namely Amra Paka or the poetic composition which is ripened like a mango, Nalikera Paka or the poetic composition which is ripened like a coconut, Mridvika Paga or the poetic composition which is ripened like a grape and finally Vrindaka Paga or the poetic composition which is ripened like the grape. For the author of Akni Purana, the poetic composition which is ripened like the grape or the Mridvika Paga is the best form of poetic composition. This is very much similar to what Bhoja calls Praudi. Now, the last guna which is Raga. Raga is a particular quality used with a view to attaining beauty of poetry. Akni Purana defines Raga as follows. It excels even the natural grace when put to constant practice. It is again of three varieties, yellow, saffron and indigo that which is within the range of its own characteristics is to be recognized as the particular author. We do not know what the author means by these three colors. He simply mentions it in Agni Purana. Now, the last variety of guna, which is called Vaisheshika guna. It is significant to note that the author does not talk much about Vaisheshika gunas except for the observation that these excellences are based upon the particular characteristic of an individual author and must be defined in terms of its own particular ideas for what lies in the power of a particular individual cannot be brought under the scope of hard and fast rules. The next author we are going to see is Vidyanatha, the author of Prataparudriya. Vidyanatha also follows Bhoja to a great extent in his approach to the theory of Guna. Following Bhoja, Vidyanatha in the fourth chapter of his Prataparudriya lists 24 gunas, although the order of these gunas slightly vary. An important observation of Vidyanatha is that out of these 24 gunas, only some gunas are actual gunas, while many others are just the reversal of certain doshas. The criterion which Vidyanatha uses to conceptualize the idea of guna is very interesting in this context. According to Vidyanatha, gunas perform two functions. First of all, some gunas elevate the poetic utterance by their presence, while 
some other gunas ward of doshas. In other words, some are gunas in themselves, while some others attain the status of gunas by virtue of their ability to ward of doshas. According to Vidyanatha, the first category is more important than the second one. Vidyanatha's observation is worth quoting here. Vidyanatha notes, among the above, some are considered qualities as the word of the blemishes and others become qualities as they become the cause of elevation by nature itself. Here, those that elevate the charm by themselves are considered most excellent. A section of the scholars does not accept those that ward off the blemishes as qualities. It is only in the opinion of those who accept that the absence of blemish is the quality that Saukumarya etc. becomes the qualities. Vidyanatha also does not accept the division of gunas into artha gunas and shabda gunas. He is of the view that there is no category called artha guna. Vidyanatha also thinks that gunas are identical with samkhadana. This shows that Vidyanatha's allegiance is with pre Anandavartana scholars. In this class, we covered a lot of points. So, let us wrap up the class. When you try to understand the concept of guna or any other concept in Sanskrit poetics, one thing that you particularly need to keep in your mind is that these concepts are not remaining static. They keep getting changed or redefined by theoreticians from various spatio-temporal locations. So, it is not possible to come up with one monolithic definition of these concepts. Whenever you are asked to talk about a particular concept from Sanskrit poetics, you need to be very specific about the person who you are going to talk these concepts in relation to. I hope that you are thorough with these concepts we have discussed so far. Thank you very much.